there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. The ancient art of Ikebana enriches our connection to nature and to our own spirituality. Today we illustrate a few concepts to start your own Japanese flower arranging with regional plants. On tour, let's visit some members of Ikebana International and hear their words. I enjoy handling any kind of flowers, including branches, trees, uh, like in uh, New Year's Day, we use uh, pine and bamboo and uh, plum tree. Those are for supposed to be New Year's celebration plant. And then uh, or any kind of flowers. You know, flower brings a smile to anybody. Ikebana, the art of Japanese flower arranging, directs our focus to absorb nature's artwork and to enrich ourselves through its reflection. It's more a spiritual story than a collection of cuttings from the garden. I would say that the Western arrangement is an arrangement of mass and color. And in the Ikebana, the Japanese arrangement, the uh, Japanese style, the Ikebana, is really creating lines and creating spaces. Begun as a Buddhist ritual to offer flowers to the spirits of the dead, over the centuries, Ikebana has evolved into several schools of philosophy. Its design significance spread to the U.S. following World War II. The Army sent me to Okinawa as a GI, and I was exposed to it there but didn't study it. And very shortly after I came back home to San Antonio, the San Antonio chapter of Ikebana International was formed. Since 1960, the San Antonio chapter of Ikebana International unites two cultures. In Japan, the art was taught to young girls before they married. Club activity, we do have a flower arranging class afterwards. And then and, and during the war, we were stopped for everything. Then after that, um, start beginning to pick up again. This one is a, a summer, summertime arrangement. Um, spring, usually the iris is blossom most and they are very short because they're in a hurry to blossom. Then uh, later on, they got a second batch of irises to start growing. Then the flower will be a lot taller. You can divide Ikebana roughly into three main classes. The classical, which are done in, so that when you look at them from the front, the arrangement has the appearance of a single trunk. The more modern arrangements are Moribana and Nagiri. Moribana are always done in a low, flat vase so that you see the expanse of water in the vase. And Nagiri are done in tall vases. So usually people start studying with Moribana because it's simpler and easier to do and you have the Kenzan that holds the material in place. These things get a little sharp needle things on, then we put the stones on to cover the, this thing, kenzan, so that they will look more natural. And we make it look like we'll bring outside into the house. We were stationed in Taiwan in 71, and uh, I made an arrangement with one of the florists there to um, do arrangements in my house once a week if he would teach me how to do it. So that's where I started my lessons in Ikebana. Now in Austin, Jay Marie wanders her garden to inspire her arrangements. This one for a dining room table represents the Ichio school of Ikebana. I was born in Hawaii and um, after World War II, um, uh, the Buddhist temples picked up where the secular Japanese language schools um, had uh, abandoned. So here I was at 11 at the end of the war, um, going to the temple every Saturday and learning um, Japanese flower arrangement, um, calligraphy, um, Japanese dancing. I refused to do the tea ceremony because I just didn't have the patience to sit that long. The school I do is the Sogetsu school. What I did was do a freestyle creative arrangement in the Nageiri. 
that's a nageire, nageire container. And in that style of arrangement, nageire literally means thrown in. But there's a trick to that. Traditionally, you use a fixture. You get a branch and you say your branch is like this and you cut it this way. You slit it in half. You balance your main branch in that slit and then you let it lean against the edge of the container and you have your main point. But in mine, um, I just literally threw it in. It's something that, you know, you look at and you have to contemplate. Um, it's peaceful, you know, and um, maybe therapeutic even. You know, it's you and your materials, you and nature. And it's very satisfying that way. It's not a gregari gregarious kind of arrangement or art. You know, you're by yourself focusing on the arrangement. My husband was a diplomat, and we were stationed in Paraguay at the time. And they had a school of floral arranging. So I entered that to improve my Spanish. It turned out to be Ikebana. And Ikebana stresses that if you like it, it's okay, it's good. You follow the rules of your school, of course. And my school is Ikinobo, which was the original school of Ikebana. And it stresses basically simplicity. In Ikinobo, we never used more than three materials, never. The uh, samples that I brought are Shimputai, and these are heaven, earth, and man, or shin, so, and tai. But we know them as, in English, as heaven, earth, and man. For this Ichio arrangement of three groupings, Jay Marie went to her garden. She chose iris leaves, umbrella plants that she bent, and cast iron leaves that she stripped. She added hydrangea as the mass flower in front. About that age, 18 or 17, you have to do the, the ikebana and the tea ceremony or before you get married. Her first lesson from the headmaster, wherever you go, you can arrange something that's meaningful, even at the North Pole or in Texas. In her Moribana arrangement, a Kenzan secures her design in its low bowl. Susan Flanagan's arrangement in the Ohara School is a summer landscape near view that replicates nature's dynamics. In other words, you have a near view, you have a, a medium or central view, and then you have a far view. You can make Ikebana in any kind of vase, whatever vase you happen to have, but you start with the basics in the flat container and then later you move on to more advanced shapes and kinds. Ikebana inspired Dawn to potter with pottery for total expression. Like any garden philosophy, it's all about where you find your harmony. Some other one is a little bit more modern. Uh, sometimes a little abstract, and, but uh, like old-fashioned like me, is I just don't dig it. <laughs> and it's about finding art around you, no matter what. Immediately after the war, uh, were very difficult times in Japan, and there weren't many flowers available, but they used anything at hand to make their ikebana, plastic, paper, metal, uh, anything at all. And so uh, the, the whole idea of Ikebana expanded greatly at that time. I think it makes you look at nature in a different way. It is very spiritual, it is very calming. 
Well, I know by now that you're really entranced by the beautiful Japanese art form of Ikebana, but we're going to take it a step further by doing some demonstrations and showing some uh, beautiful arrangements live here in the studios. I'm joined by uh, J. Marie Boutros with the Ikebana International Society here locally, and it's a pleasure to have you uh, back to Central Texas Gardener, J. Marie. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, this is uh, uh, such a beautiful and uh, uh, I think very soulful art form. I'm, I'm real curious, why do you think this is such an important art form today for the people who practice it? I really think it's important today because we live in such a busy, busy society. We're always going, always doing, and yeah. we really need to stop and enjoy nature because mm -hmm. God has given us such beauty in nature. Mm -hmm. And by doing the Ikebana, uh, your inner beauty comes out through your arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I think it just gives you a sense of peace. I know it does me mm -hmm. and serenity. And uh, it's just a very pleasant way to um, have a beautiful day. Yeah, you know, I think that for a lot of people, I love what you said about the busyness of our times. Oh. We're, we're busy, we live almost at a violent speed, mm -hmm. and we're distracted all the time mm -hmm. by cell phones and right. this, that, and the other, always going off around us, that we've, we, we forget to pay attention. And exactly. this is an art form that really calls for kind of maximum attention in a way. Well, not only that, in doing a cabana, um, you try to do within your arrangements mm -hmm the way the flower itself is in nature. Mm -hmm. So you need to be aware as you walk and see how the flower is growing, mm -hmm. which way it presents itself, which yeah. way the leaf is top and bottom, and yeah. all this comes together in Ikebana. So it, it helps you to become more aware of nature as you're crossing the street or going down the sidewalk, whatever. Or in your own garden, which exactly. is the case for you because that's where you get your subject material. Now, I know a lot of people might be tempted to go to the florist to get the flowers for these arrangements, but your, uh, the plants that you use all come from your garden. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I like to, to grow what I'm going to use and then go out in the yard and see what's there mm -hmm. and then choose my material and then come in and decide, well, now is this a special occasion or mm -hmm. am I doing this just for myself? And then arrange accordingly. So you can do Ikebana with plants from anywhere in the world? Yes. Anywhere. Yes. Okay. So it doesn't, yes. you don't have to go to Japan. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Though, though that would be fun if, yes. you, if, you, if you got the opportunity to do it. Now, um, we've been talking about this spiritual connection. You brought a couple of lovely arrangements. And I'd like to just kind of explore these a little bit with you in terms of what they express for you. The first one I'd like to talk about is one that's a, a low arrangement with gorgeous roses mm -hmm. and some other, uh, a lily and some other things. Share with us a little bit about the kind of the philosophy or the spirit of this particular arrangement. Well, I belong to a school called Ichio, and uh, they began in 1936. Mm -hmm. And that is when the Western movement was coming over to Japan mm -hmm. somewhat. So they were being exposed to more different types of flowers and also a different um, uh, environment socially. Mm -hmm. You would see tables and you would have a meal at a table with chairs, so we started needing centerpieces. Okay. And uh, Ichio was one of the first to create the centerpiece. And as you will see in my arrangement, the roses are slanting toward the right side, okay. so you would put this at the right end of your table. Okay. Yet it is visual and uh, from all around, mm -hmm. 360. And if you had a long table, you would put one slanted to the left side okay. for uh, the other side, for mm. the other part of the table. If you had a really big table, then in the center, mm -hmm. you would put a round one. Mm -hmm. And I chose the classic style of um, container mm -hmm. because if you're going to do three, you really need something that is very simple mm -hmm. and uh, more of the classic style. Yeah. If you're going to do just one, you could use some of your other containers, mm -hmm. but that's why I chose that. Yeah. Well, the it's it's gorgeous in its simplicity, and it just seems to kind of f float there. Mm -hmm. You know, is that part of the spirit of this particular thing? How how what what did the, what did uh, uh, is expressed about the flowers in, in this in this arrangement? Right in in Ikebana, um you know, the, the, the religious philosophy behind it, you know, the Shinto was the first religion of the, the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had many deities and mm -hmm. they were tied to nature, nature yeah. you know, heaven and earth mm -hmm. and man. And so many of the, of the philosophy of the schools, your tallest one is heaven. Mm -hmm. And then comes earth. 
and then comes man. Okay. So the one that's the biggest and the lowest is usually man. Okay. And the highest one is usually heaven. Okay. And then uh, where you see my uh, shredded one, mm -hmm. that would be my, my earth. Okay. And the, the other arrangement you brought, lovely, uh, a, a, a much more ethereal quality to it, less grounded in a way. Um, and I really love this. Uh, this and this ha ha uses some other classic techniques, doesn't it? Right. Uh, what's in that is normal. Before they had the centerpieces and things mm -hmm. like this in a Japanese home, you have a niche, and so you're viewing this flower arrangement from the front only. Okay. And so the tall stems in this arrangement then would be your heaven, mm -hmm. and this is a um, a grouping mm -hmm. kind of arrangement. And actually, the ones I used were my sweet bay laurel. Right. And then the ones that are crossing over it, which again, Ichio was the first school to do a crossing method. Uh, those are umbrella plants, which mm -hmm. I'll show you later on how sure. to do. Sure, um, umbrella sedge, right. right? And then the ones in the front are orchids because okay. they're some of my favorites. Yeah, well, it's it's absolutely lovely, and, uh, and the the vase that they're in is terrific as well. Now, um, you let's, sh let's show some of the techniques. Uh, of okay. the, and you, know, you have the umbrella umbrella sedge here. Right. And, and, uh, and you can do see this one is flowering from the winter. Uh, so right. if you wanted to, you could do something with this. Right. But what I've done is I've taken it and come up just a fistful. And cut it off. Okay. And makes it nice and short and stubby. And you'll see where it was stubby in the um, mm -hmm. the one that was bent. But right. also, if you look at the centerpiece one mm -hmm. under the roses, you'll see two very very short ones. Yes, yes. And some... then one that's T90 that's mm -hmm. right in front of it. But this stem bends very easily. Mm -hmm. And when you you just have to take it and bend it. Right. And it'll pretty much hold its position. Right. And then you can use, of course, there are devices within the container to hold them in place as you do the it. The Kinzon. Kinzon, or what we would call a frog. A frog, <laughs> or some people call them pin cushions. Right. But the, the Kinzons that are made with the brass mm -hmm. uh, pins right. are actually the best. And then you've seen how I've had mm -hmm. small ones, large ones. Sure. There are large ones like this that have irregular sizes right. for using wood and things right. like that. Okay. So this is what we would do to get this arrangement and then if you had more than that you would just cut them at different levels for I what see. you wanted to I do. Now you brought an aspidistra leaf as well and in the short arrangement there's this beautiful, I, I had to do a double take to see what that was and then I finally figured out what it was and that's a shredded aspidistra leaf and you're just using your nails right. here. I'm just using my fingernails and if you'll see on the aspidistra they're veins. Right. So what you're going to do follow is just the follow the vein, and right. you're going to go on and on, and mm -hmm. it doesn't take too long to shred this thing. Mm -hmm. And today I chose to take one and actually roll it up and make it very short. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you that you don't even have to do that. All right. I've been out in my garden and I've lost a lot of fingernails. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's, it's a rare thing to find nice fingernails on a garden. Let me tell you that, oh, Jane. <laughs> I'll tell you. But okay, and then you would just this, clip it off. Right, but in this, you can even you can okay. have it in your arrangement where it's like that. Okay. And what I chose to do is cut the stem very, very short. Okay. And I just put it through here. And voila. And we have a little one like that. Okay. Well, people can learn a lot more about all of this at an upcoming event in San Antonio, and that's going to be happening uh, in February. We have information about that online. Mm -hmm. And tell us real very briefly about the event. Well, it's um, on the 5th of February, and it's the Asian Festival, and they try to bring in all the different Asian arts. And so our... Um, group has mm -hmm. been invited to do the yeah. flower arrangements. Well, people, well, that's wonderful. And people can learn more about that at klru.org slash ctg. And Jay Marie, thank you for sharing this gorgeous art form with us. You're very welcome. All right. My and, pleasure. Okay, well, coming up next is Daphne Richards. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is another great one from one of our viewers, Joe Lee. She wants to know about freshly cult cut mulch. She's heard that it's hot and it shouldn't be used right away around the plants. And this is true. It's because of the decomposition of plant material in branches, which are mostly carbon. So you do have to be careful about the carbon to nitrogen ratio. There are microbes in your soil which do decompose plant material, 
And as they do this, as they digest the plant material, they need both carbon and nitrogen. So they can deplete the nitrogen in your soil, which would take that away from your plants. So you do need to go ahead and put that fresh mulch out in a pile and make sure that it ages for just a little while. A couple of weeks to a month is all it would take, and then it would be safe to use. It wouldn't decompose quite so quickly. This type of mulch material is pretty easy to get this time of year from friends and neighbors or even companies that come through neighborhoods and do prune trees. But again, you do need to be careful of it. You can also add some nitrogen to your soil to help assist with this process, some nitrogen fertilizer. Our plant this week is viburnum. This is a great big shrub and it's a nice alternative to our non-native plants that we often use as hedges. Some species of viburnum get 6 to 10 feet tall and wide, but some get as large as 12 to 20 feet tall. So be very careful when you're shopping so that you get the right size plant for the place that you're going to put it. You don't need to prune this plant unless you're hedging it, but still try to keep it close to its natural size and don't cut too much off of it. It's not good for our native plants to do that. It does have beautiful fluffy white flower clusters, which are great for attracting butterflies. And then it does produce nice pink berries that turn to blue, so it's very attractive to birds. If you have an area where you like to watch the birds fly around, this is great to attract those. You can also use it alone as a small tree if you're willing to prune it into that habit. Its native habitat is swampy, but it's not picky about the soil. It's also drought resistant, so it's a great plant to use in any area of your landscape. It is native for us, and it's hardy to all the way to zone 5, so it can take our cold winters. It takes full sun or part shade, so it's very adaptable, and it is evergreen, so it's nice during the winter. To do this week in your garden, our recent cold weather might have killed same things back. These days, it's caught, and then it's cold, and then it's hot, and then it's cold. So maybe you want to plant an annual right now, something colorful to lift your spirits in that dreary winter landscape. You can choose flowering cabbage or kale, snapdragons or pansies. Those are great color this time of year as transplants. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Guy LeBlanc for Backyard Basics. Welcome to Backyard Basics. I'm Guy LeBlanc. Today I'm going to talk about two tree care problems common in Central Texas. And the first are these plants here, commonly referred to as ball moss. Now these are found on a variety of tree species in the Gulf states and in Central Texas, most commonly on live oak and cedar elm. Ball moss is not a true moss, but is actually in the bromeliad family. This means it's related to orchids. It spreads by means of a windblown seed, very much like dandelion. Very little research has been done on ball moss, but it's not believed to be parasitic. As an air plant, it's believed that it receives its nutrition through air and rainfall. However, most arborists in the Austin area, including myself, believe that when present in heavy quantities, ball moss can cause slow decline in plants by shading out sunlight from the leaves. Heavy quantities of ball moss can also increase the surface area for ice accumulation, and this can lead to an increased number of broken branches. For these reasons, I highly recommend removing moss before it becomes too heavy in the tree. Two methods are typically used for this, spraying and manual removal. In my opinion, spraying is far less effective. You only kill about 60% of the moss and the moss will stay on the trees for several months until it decays enough to fall off of the tree. One of the chemicals commonly used for this purpose is baking soda. While this sounds benign, the alkalinity and salinity of baking soda can cause soil chemistry problems. Another chemical commonly used is copper hydroxide. However, copper hydroxide is toxic to aquatic plants and we can't use it near waterways. Also, its bright blue color can stain light-colored objects near the tree being sprayed. More recently, potassium bicarbonate is showing some promise. However, this is not readily available in large quantities and like baking soda, is not labeled for this use. For these reasons, I highly recommend manual removal. In heavily infested trees, about 60% of the moss is going to be on dead branches, and these should be removed for the health of the plant anyway. Judicious pruning can remove nearly 100% of the moss. However, this last point is very critical. It's important to remove not too much of the foliage when doing this type of pruning. If we remove too much foliage, not only are we defeating the purpose, but we're harming the tree. The second problem I'm going to talk about today are root sprouts on live oaks. 
Although live oaks produce acorns like all other oaks, their main method of propagation is through root sprouting. However, these root sprouts can cause problems in our landscapes when thousands of them are generated around the trunk of a mature tree. Unfortunately, almost no research has been done on the control of root sprouts, but there is some evidence that they develop in response to an elevated grade. This is another reason not to put too much soil or even too much mulch around the base of a tree. I find that you can be fairly aggressive in physically removing these sprouts, but it's important not to remove more than about a third of an inch of, in diameter. You should never use herbicide for this purpose. Absorption of the herbicide could cause significant dieback in the tree. Also, it's not necessary to paint the sprouts after they've been removed. I find that landscape fabric and about two inches of mulch will greatly inhibit sunlight after you've removed the sprouts. However, once they've developed, it's nearly impossible to permanently eliminate sprouts from the trunk of your tree. For Backyard Basics, I'm Guy LeBlanc. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and read our blog. Next week, tune in for Tomato Talk. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.